of God comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Give attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grant grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. So ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this just beautiful portion of your word uh, through the Apostle Paul that speaks so much of our salvation and the benefits thereof, Lord, the many blessings that you give. Help us, Lord, now to see these things, these wondrous things contained in your law, that our hearts might rejoice in our salvation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. You'll notice that this is uh, titled, Blessed with Every Spiritual Blessing, and it comes, obviously, from verse 3, where Paul says that we are blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Now, before we get into the, the meat of the, uh, the passage, I think it's useful for us to understand why Paul likely said, every spiritual blessing blessing. We kind of got a taste of that earlier when we read from Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, there's one portion where he's talking about the blessings that they have had, Israel has had in that point of God, bringing them out of Egypt. And uh, ultimately, he will be bringing them into the promised land. And many of the things that God promises in his covenant in the Old Testament are what we would call temporal or earthly blessings. He promises them things like land, food, health, growth as a people, protection. These are all earthly types of blessings. But even in those earthly types of blessings, God is trying to communicate deeper spiritual blessings uh, to his people that ultimately come about in their fullness or are made known in their fullness in the New Testament. When the, the spiritual blessings that we have in belonging to Christ are made manifest, they're clear to us. And so Paul is beginning this letter to the Ephesians as he does in other places, by reminding them, by giving them a bit of good doctrine, uh, he's reminding them of the blessings that they have, the good things that God has done for them in Christ. And this is what Paul does, or I should say, Paul does this, in order that the Ephesian church, and then everyone who would read this letter followed, would praise the Father and the Son. Blessed be the Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Paul's purpose in this introduction to this book of Ephesians, these opening statements, 
is trying to spur them on to remember and consider the things that God has done for them so that they would continue to be a people of heartfelt praise. That's what Paul wants his listeners to do. And he doesn't just tell them to bless God, to praise God, to give God thanksgiving. He gives them the things that he most likely himself is thankful for and the things that they, they ought to be thankful for. And so he tells them that they are blessed in Christ. All of the spiritual blessings that we have come because of our union with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We are supposed to right away notice the abundance of the goodness of these blessings. Every spiritual blessing. Paul's later on going to talk about lavishing God's grace. We're to see these things as an abundance of the good things that God gives us. And he says that they are in the heavenly places. Now, there's a couple ways we can even look at this phrase. One is that all of our blessings have a heavenly origin. They come from God who reigns in the heavens. But also, the ultimate end of our blessings are heavenly. Are, are, are found in our being with God for all of eternity. That's where they, they end up. They don't end there, but they, they end up there. They're final in there. They're in their fullness there. So, as we look at this passage, we're going to look at it under three headings this morning. The first is election. The second is adoption. And the third is redemption. So, election, adoption, redemption. So again, we go back to the text. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in love. Blameless before him. In love, he predestined us. The doctrine of election, I think, is actually a beautiful doctrine. I know that there are those who are outside of the Reformed faith who find the doctrine of election repulsive. They find it contrary to what they think or what they experience. They, they find it horrible that in God electing, that means he does not elect others. And they consider that to not be fair. I don't want to talk about the fairness of it this morning, only to say if God did what was fair, none of us would be saved. That's fair. That's fair. And I don't want to focus on the, the unelect side this morning, it, only incidentally. But I do want to focus on the blessings of election, of being chosen. God's mode of operations throughout the Bible is to choose. Think about it. From the earliest days, he chooses specific people. From the earliest days, he chooses groups. He chooses who to bless. And he chooses who to curse. And we should expect him to act no differently in the New Testament. God chooses some to bless. And Paul wants the Ephesians to rejoice in being those who are receiving the blessing of God. Knowing that the blessings of God come not from something that they have done, but out of the great Love and grace and wisdom of God. Now, I know that this passage doesn't actually use the word election. 
or elect. Paul uses that plenty of other places, and I think we can easily match choice with election. We understand what choice is very simply. We go to the grocery store. We go down the cereal aisle. We like cereal. And we choose one cereal, and we leave the rest of the cereals behind. We don't take them with us. We choose one. We understand the concept of election by going into our, our polling places, and we pick a one candidate, and we don't pick other candidates. It's very clear. Uh, we exercise our will to either get what we want or have who we want to rule over us. The election of God isn't much different. God is making a free choice of his own will, out of his own wisdom, love, and grace, for many reasons that we will not understand this side of the grave and may never understand on the other side of the grave, though I think there we probably won't care either. He chooses. Why does he, ch or I should say, who does he choose? Paul just says, us. As he chose us in him. Well, who's us? That's a good question. Who does Paul mean by us? Us is an inclusive term, so Paul is obviously including himself in the group of those who have been chosen. Us also includes the people that you're, you're speaking to, us, about, us, so we, us includes the Ephesians. But the fullest meaning of us is all of those throughout time, throughout geography, throughout history, who receive the blessings of God. Anyone whom God chooses to bless. And we may not understand why we are us, why we are part of the us. But we can certainly rejoice in its benefits. When was this choice made? He says, that he chose us in Christ, in him, before the foundation of the world. So what does that mean? To choose us before the foundation of the world. It means that before we ever were, before anything ever was, God chose people for himself. People who existed only if we can say at this point in the mind of God. People who had not yet been born, because no one had been born, as a matter of fact, there was no universe. There was no earth. And it's not based on anything that God saw in us. Or anything we had done, because we had done nothing. We weren't even existing yet to have potentially done something. just simply chose us out of his grace and love. And it says that we are chosen to be holy and blameless before him. Holy and blameless before him. Now, we'll talk about that further when we talk about the blessings of, of redemption. But Paul has in mind, uh, I think, maybe two different ideas here. Because we are, as we stand before God in Christ, standing holy and blameless. We are made holy and blameless because of Christ. We are set apart. That's the first meaning of the word holy. Set apart. And we are also Chosen to be holy and blameless in practice as we more and more conform our lives to the image of Christ. 
and the will of God. And so we can rightly say that we are chosen to be holy and blameless before God. Which leads us to the doctrine of adoption. Verse 5. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Adoption is another one of those popular themes with Paul. This isn't the only place he talks about it. What is adoption? What does adoption mean when we talk about it? in its theological sense. Westminster Larger Catechism answers that question in number 74, what is adoption? Adoption is an act of the free grace of God in and for his only Son, Jesus Christ, whereby all those who are justified are received into the number of children, having his name put on them, the spirit of his Son given to them, and are under his fatherly care and dispensations, admitted to all the liberties and privileges of the sons, made heirs of all the promises and fellow heirs with Christ in glory. Simply put, to adopt means to take someone in to your family as your child with all of the the rights and the privileges due them and the responsibilities that are upon you as parents. Adoption is a choice. We made a choice 22 years ago, I guess you could say, 22 years ago to adopt, to adopt. Because we wanted a child, and for various reasons, that wasn't prudent the other ways. So we adopted. We made a choice. And we were, Jacob was legally declared to be our son with all of the rights and privileges. I wish I could remember the exact words that the judges used, but it's something along those lines. So God, the judge of the universe, legally declared that each one of the elect are his children. God the judge is also God the Father who is declaring, you're my children. You belong to me. That means that you are the objects of my fatherly love and affection. Yes, you're also the objects of my fatherly correction and instruction. But you are the objects of my fatherly love. Not temporarily, but finally. For all of eternity, God's decree of election does not get revoked. Adoption is not like marriage in that sense. Marriages can end in a divorce or an annulment in, in certain circumstances. There's no reversal of adoptions. And we should be grateful. We should be praising him, as he says, to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glorious grace. That's what he wants us to do, as I said. He wants us to contemplate what it means to belong to God and all of the goodness that comes from being adopted of God, to be part of his family, to be called a son, to be lavished upon with this love, to have an inheritance that is unfading and kept for us in the heavenlies. We belong to God. To the praise of his glorious grace. I think Paul is trying to get us to praise God a little bit for what he's done. And he says, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us 
in the beloved. One commentator points out that we miss a word play here in English. Those, in a very literal sense, it should be grace by which he graced us. It's kind of like when Paul says, rejoice with exceeding joy. The grace with which he graced us. The grace, the good favor, grace, that good favor that we don't deserve. Those good gifts. We praise his grace. Romans 8.32 He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So Paul wants us to thank God for election. He wants us to praise God for adoption. And now he will go on to talk about our redemption. Our redemption. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and in insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Redemption. Redemption. We have redemption through his blood. What does it mean to redeem something? We may think of it in a, in, in a purely uh, financial way. When you give a coupon to the store clerk to the cashier you are redeeming that coupon for something you're redeeming it when you have a voucher of something you redeem that voucher there is a transaction that takes place in our redemption the transaction that takes place is the blood of Christ on our behalf Christ gives his blood and his body his physical life to purchase us, in a sense. Now, just an, a little side note, some people have said in theology, in history past, that the God pays a ransom to the devil, and that is just ridiculous. God is redeeming people from his own wrath by the blood of Christ. To make us his own. That's the point of redemption. That God is paying a price to make us his own. Price not paid to the devil. It's a price to God's own justice. To make us his own. And in redemption, it's not just about making us his own as, as adoption is, but there are so many other things to it. As he says... The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Grace, another one of Paul's favorite words. It's a good word, grace. Something we don't deserve. To remind us again that our forgiveness of our sins is something that we do not earn. It is something we cannot earn, but it has been earned for by the blood of Christ. And notice again how he talks about God's grace. The riches of God's grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. God's grace is super abundant. It is beyond measure. And so he is able to lavish us in grace. I don't know why, but I think of uh, someone who is being, maybe not, I do know why, someone who is being given maybe a, a, a bride on her wedding day or maybe uh, a birthday where someone is just lavished with gifts, gifts upon gifts upon gifts. I think of a spoiled kid at Christmas getting 
lavished with gifts is poured out upon him or her. Except in this case, it's not a spoiled child. It's us. But we are spoiled children. He lavishes it. He pours it out beyond measure. But yet it says he does it in all wisdom and insight. Even though he lavishes it upon us, God does so with great understanding. This is not some rich man just simply throwing money at a problem, pulling out a wad of cash and tossing it around. This is God's measured and considered lavishing of his grace. It is free, but it is intentional. God knows exactly every person who is the recipient of his lavish grace. Then he says a, a strange phrase in, in verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which is set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. What is the mystery of his will? What is he talking about? What does that, how does that relate to being set forth in Christ? When the New Testament uses the word mystery, it's often referring to the fact that in the Old Testament, things were concealed. I, I'm trying to remember the exact phrase, but the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The, the work of Christ on our behalf in the Old Testament is it's shadowed. It's presented in, in types and in symbols and in the actions of God. It's hidden in the words of the prophets, which wouldn't be understood until Christ came. So in that sense, it's a mystery. It's a mystery that is made known to us in the gospel. Because now what was concealed is now revealed. The mystery is made known in God's purpose. It was time to set forth Christ. A plan for the fullness of time. At the right time, Christ to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In a very real way, the redemption that Christ purchases is not just the redemption of his elect, but it will be the redemption of all things. Not all people, but of all things. For the earth itself is under a curse because of sin. We die. We get sick. We have all sorts of family problems. There are problems on the earth. There are famines. There are wars. There are floods. There are earthquakes. And all of that will be summed up. All of that will creation will be redeemed on the day when the new heavens and the new earth are revealed. A place that God has made for us. A place that God has made for us. Now the first application of this is pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's the application that Paul wants. Here's these wonderful things that God has done for you. Be grateful. Be thankful. Praise Him. Praise Him among the saints, praise him in private. Praise him daily. Praise him weekly in the congregation of the saints. Praise him, thank him, thank him, praise him. That one's pretty clear. 
And he does a really good job of giving us a reason. Giving us several reasons. But as I thought about this, there's another application for us in our lives. As I contemplate all of these blessings, and I think about the people that I encounter regularly, especially as I think about the lives of some of the kids that are in the schools these days, and I think about how both kids and adults are longing for a sense of belonging, acceptance, love, forgiveness maybe even. They're, they're longing for these things. And we offer them the greatest possible sense of acceptance and love and meaning and purpose. And we can freely offer that to them in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Putting aside this, the idea of election for just a moment, we obviously don't know who the elect are, but that doesn't stop us from freely proclaiming the gospel. It never does, and it never should, and anybody who is consistent in their Reformed theology will tell you that knowing that the elect are out there should drive us to evangelism, not drive us away. But we can offer. We can offer meaning and purpose and belonging to people. In the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can explain to them why their lives are broken because of sin. Why they have an extreme sense of guilt. And what they can do with that guilt. And that there is someone who loves them who will never take that love away. Someone who accepts them, who will never take that acceptance away. Our world needs this. This generation needs this. The generation that's coming up needs this. And the church has it. And as I've said about the gospel before, the gospel is so valuable that it has its most value when we give it away. Let's be a people who are free with the grace of God and giving it and offering it to others who desperately need it but don't even realize that's what they need. Let's pray. God, our Father, it is wonderful to bless you, to praise you for even the right to call you that. We do not call you that just because it is in the prayer, but because you are our Father. We thank you for the many benefits of election and adoption, of redemption. And Lord, knowing we're not even done talking about those benefits just from this one book, Lord, help us to be grateful. But Lord, help us also to be one who can speak freely about the grace, the lavish grace we have through Jesus Christ our Lord from you. Lord, I pray for those that we know, whether they are family or friends, kids in school, customers who walk in, whatever the case it might be, that we would be free in offering them grace and forgiveness and telling them of the lavish love and grace of God. Give us wisdom, Lord, 
to speak the words of truth, the words of love, the words of life. Lord, that you might grow your church and advance your kingdom through your grateful saints. We pray this in Jesus' name. This is Pastor Howard Sloan of King of Kings Reformed Church here in Bedford, Pennsylvania. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today, and I hope it blessed you. If you would like more information about King of Kings Reformed Church, you can visit us on the web at kingofkingsreform.com, or you can check us out on Facebook at King of Kings Bedford. Either way, I hope you check us out, and may you find the blessing of knowing and being known by our Lord Jesus Christ.